Good morning, everybody. Uh, just a, a bit of background on my thesis. I've been uh, kind of future scanning uh, technologies for low cost digital recording, which has kind of developed into looking at autonomous and semi autonomous vehicles. I've got a blog that's cataloguing many of these, and this presentation will be concentrating on unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. Kind of call, I'm calling them drones just because it fits in nicely with the title of the conference. Oop. <coughs> All right, uh, they're, they're, they're most simple. Uh, drones can provide an aerial platform for cameras, so you can uh, take aerial views of sites, as in the first image. They can also provide an aerial platform for videos, which as I'm sure many of you are aware of, have been increasingly used in television documentaries. But they can also provide uh, an aerial mapping system which uh, can be comparable to LiDAR data uh, in areas where it's too expensive and it can provide, actually provide a higher level of detail which I'll be showing you in a while. Um, English Heritage Historic England have been using drones for quite a while in quite a few areas of interest. Uh, an important technology is the gimbal which the rubber balls um, remove the vibration from the motors while the uh, camera is stabilized by the two motors. I did have an animated GIF for this, but it didn't work, so I'll just do it old, old school. Uh, basically, that's your camera, and your drone will be <laughs> flying around, and your camera will be staying nice and steady, and you'll have a lovely video at the end of it. Um, you can control the gimbal uh, from the ground on a lot of uh, remote controls, but with with the DJI Inspire 1 you can actually buy a separate controller so one person could be flying the drone while a separate person is recording the video. Uh, there's uh, new 360 degree camera technologies which can be fitted to drones. Uh, some of them, there's quite a few of them are actually crowdfunded and they're basically cameras with a lot of different lenses but there's also the other solution which is multiple cameras attached to a mount and videos can be stitched together and in case in case of the bottom right photo you can actually record in 3D with quite a few GoPro cameras which adds up. Um, you can play these videos in virtual reality headgear and you can also play them on YouTube if you want which now allows you to pan through 360 degree videos. Um, archaeological mapping is an important area I'm sure many people know 50, uh, at least 50% of sites were discovered from aerial imagery. Uh, they can provide high level detail, they can provide additional information for a desk-based assessment if you're on a fly drone before it. If you're stripping a site for a road scheme you can fly your drone over it and it will give you aerial imagery of that and you can decide on excavation areas and various stuff like that. Uh, Historic England have been doing condition monitoring of the top of walls of uh, a number of their buildings and it can also be combined with grand photogrammetry to make a, a complete 3D model of the site. Um, most mapping solutions are, well, they're either fixed wing or rotor with a camera mounted that just points downwards but you can also use a gimbal if you want. Well, the mapping uh, requires the autopilot system, which you control with the controller, which then the autopilot controls the motors, like increasing or decreasing power, depending on where you want to go. But you can also set uh, a path for the autopilot to fly and has the ability to trigger a camera at set places as you're flying around. And by setting up ground control points on the ground, which you can see in photographs, which you set up with a differential GPS, you can then get centimeter accuracy because the GPS on the drone is only generally uh, meter accuracy. Right. Setting up the flight path, you, you can select a polygon around the area you want to map. You then select the camera you want to use, the altitude, the flying speed, and the image overlap photogrammetry. It creates a mission for you, which you then upload to the autopilot. You set the mode on the drone to auto and it will fly the flight path for you, taking photos as it flies. Then once you get the camera back, you can download the images and at the simplest, you can just stitch them together to 
create a <coughs> mosaic example on the right. Or obviously you can use photogrammetry software to create 3D models, author photos, or digital elevation models, which you can import into GIS software. Here's some uh, examples of a flight I did over a round barrel in Hampshire. And obviously you can import this data into uh, GIS. This is my photogrammetry, or sorry, my digital elevation model that I created over the 25 centimetre LiDAR data and you can see how much more detail you're getting from the photogrammetry than the LiDAR. Obviously you can do various other GIS cool stuff, add some contours, do that sort of stuff, and you can also do profiles through the barrow and this profile shows quite well the damage to the southeast quadrant of that round barrow, just seen this from excavation. Uh, there's also the possibility of condition surveys of monuments where obviously you fly it once then you fly it at a later date possibly after some <coughs> damage and then you can compare the two digital elevation models within GIS software using the cut fill system and you can calculate the volume of uh, material removed. I was also having a play with the 3D model of filling in the part of the footpath that randomly goes straight through the middle of the round barrow and the excavation damage and then comparing the two models and the green and red stuff is the difference between those two models. Right, as I mentioned earlier there are accuracy problems with the GPS on the drone and real-time kinematics is a possible or solution to this because it can provide centimetre accuracy obviously but uh, the example over there relies on a base station but Base stations can be kind of ten thousand pound upwards, but there are a couple of crowdfunded systems that have just been released, which could solve many problems. You wouldn't need to like cover the field with ground control points before you did your survey. You could just survey in one point, uh, place your uh, RTK base station system on there, while the other connects to the drone, and it would provide the drone with centimetre accuracy. GPS data which could be geotagged to the photographs so when you import the photographs into your photogrammetry software you can just use the information from the photographs to accurately create the 3D model. But the next step I've been having a look at is multispectral archaeological mapping. I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, the phenomenon of crop marks. Uh, basically over a ditch the crop grows more lush and green while over a wall it kind of grows less lush and kind of a darker colour. Obviously this is us seeing it in the visible spectrum but you can also see it in the uh, near infrared spectrum and you can actually see it with more detail. And this is, this is an example of why with a healthy leaf on the left and an unhealthy one on the right. You can see visible spectrum on the left and the near infrared on the right and you can see the dramatic difference in the near infrared between the two leaves where there's not much difference in the visible apart from the green spike which is obviously the green colour of the leaf which is now brown. Uh, recording technologies, there are some high cost, high quality um, multispectral cameras which are around £4,000 but I've been looking into obviously lower cost solutions including the Mapier camera which is about the same size as the GoPro and I believe the company used to alter GoPro cameras and have started building their own systems. So that's around £210 plus that, it's very reasonable. But there's also a DIY solution which I did do myself on the right which involves taking your camera to pieces, spending an afternoon chiseling glue off some screws and then replacing the internal filter with one that lets near infrared light through. Because the sensor on the camera will record near infrared light, it's just the filter that stops it generally from doing that. So there's various pieces of software, but there is an open source solution which is a plugin for uh, an image processing system which is obviously free. Uh, the normalized different vegetation index is basically a way of converting the near infrared light which we can't see into the visible spectrum and then representing it. An example from aerial photography that Historic England did 
comparing a standard photo with a near-infrared one and with the crop marks and round barrels, you can see how much more pronounced uh, the evidence is. Obviously, you can fly drones at various times of the year, but there's obviously drawbacks because the stress on crops caused by water and various things is generally only over the summer months, which is this is a perfect example of this. I flew my Mapier camera over the same round barrow in Hampshire, and this is the result. And obviously, you can see the blue stuff is water because <laughs> most of the new forest was very wet at the time, so there's not much in the way of stress on it. But <coughs> it's just an example of how easy it is. I just flew that in uh, 10 minutes, then came back and processed it, and it didn't take very long at all. Right, another area I've been looking at is the potential for site tour recording, obviously with uh, funding issues in archaeology and cultural heritage and the increase in crowdfunding of archaeology excavations. Uh, people are more interested in seeing the results of the excavation and an interesting site tour with aerial imagery would be one option. You can obviously fly the drone, um, uh, get somebody to fly the drone around the person, but this has the potential that one person could be recording the site tour of themselves. Uh, one option is one of the flight modes on most uh, open source autopilot systems, which is Follow Me, where an app is running on uh, a mobile phone in your pocket and the drone will basically follow the GPS on that mobile phone. And there's various cinematic controls you can choose for how the drone flies around while it's filming you. The second option is computer vision technologies, which are quite cutting the edge. It's where, as you can see in the app for the DGI here, uh, you've got the video of a person, you actually select that target, and then the computer matches each frame of the video to determine where the person is and keep following the person as it flies along. There's options of doing this with multiple different targets, so if you were doing a site tour and you had the person talking about an object, the person and the object could be the different targets and the camera could be filming them, then you could turn off the, the, the archaeology he's talking about as he walks somewhere else and the drone will follow him around. There's uh, two basic systems at the minute. One is a companion computer technology which you add to a drone you've already got, but the soon to be released DJI Phantom 4 has its technology within it as well, which will be quite cool. Uh, building facade recording is another area I've been looking at. Um, obviously it provides a means to get a camera higher than other options and possibly uh, record things you can't see in any other way. It requires a certain number of input parameters including uh, coordinates at the end of the wall height of the wall, the camera, sensor size and field of view, the required image overlap for photogrammetry and the level of detail. So uh, with my supervisor we created uh, an Excel spreadsheet with these input parameters and did all the calculations. Uh, to do some of the calculations you need a bit of trigonometry which considering it's been a long time since I was at school, that was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> so you can uh, calculate the distance from the wall depending on uh, the field of view of the camera and the level of detail you want. And then you can use that to uh, calculate the offset coordinates to fly the set distance away from the wall. Um, 3DR, which is an American drone manufacturer and it's closely linked to uh, the open source autopilot technology recently released um, some developer tools for Python, Android and the cloud which allows you to write scripts to communicate with the drone autopilot and control it. I've been uh, having a play with DroneKit Python. It provides a load of uh, useful examples which you can just change to do what you want. I've written uh, a Python code using the input parameters we discussed earlier, does its calculations and then creates the output parameters. Then it creates a file which combines 
the output data with the commands from the drone kit I mentioned earlier into a single file. You then run that file and it sends a load of commands to the drone and the drone will then hopefully do what you want. I've just been uh, having a play with a virtual drone for the time being due to some technical issues with my drone. Um, so there's a load of open source software which allows you to basically fly a virtual drone on the map. You can also connect the um, base station software which I showed you earlier to this so it's basically the same as flying the drone in the real world. Uh, this is an example I did manually with my Phantom 2 and GoPro which was a challenge under some trees without GPS but uh, it turned out okay. <laughs> um, obviously there's some problems with uh, the, the technique, we've already talked about the GPS issues which could be helped as well with targets on the wall and ground control points. Uh, there's also, well, for safety reasons and just to kind of protect the facade you're recording, you need to put some safety restraints. These can be done with ultrasonic sensors which basically fire sound at the target uh, and calculate the time it takes for it to come back and so the distance that uh, the wall is away. So this can both control the distance from the wall and the distance from the ground. Um, another problem is holding the exact position. Uh, optical flow technology is one solution for this. It basically uh, takes a load of uh, video frames and then compares them to each other so it can determine whether the drone is moving, what direction it's moving. It can send this information back to the autopilot and the autopilot can correct the flight path. <coughs> the next step I want to look at is high dynamic range, building facade recording, which is basically taking multiple photographs with different exposure settings, which allows more of the dynamic range of the image to be recorded. So basically you're taking some photos to remove the excess light while you're taking other photos to try and remove the shadows. And you can see the difference between the standard photo on the left and the high dynamic range one on the right, which is giving you more information. And these can be used to create photogrammetry models as well. Uh, it has some extra requirements over the standard building, building facade because you need to take multiple images without the drone moving too much. So I've been having a look at the calculations of working out the fastest shutter speed I can use that still allows me to record enough of the depth of field basically of the building in focus so I can actually use it for uh, photogrammetry. Uh, there are obviously some limitations. I've discussed quite a few of them already. Uh, flight time is, is a main one at the minute. We're relying on uh, lithium ion battery technology which provides rotors with between 15 and 25 minutes of flight time but uh, there's a load of technology industries including Formula E racing which are pushing forward battery technology and looking for better systems. One of these I was looking at is lithium oxygen technology which uh, in some cases they suggest might have 10 times the amount of power than uh, lithium ion which would be a dramatic increase. Uh, another solution is tethered drones, which well, obviously would seem a bit of a step backwards, but if you've got power on site, you could power the drone straight from the ground, or you could have much more battery power on the ground. Obviously, they have safety uh, benefits as well, if they're not going to fly away. <laughs> it would be a bit of a problem. Um, but there's also the potential for much higher data streaming from the ground. At the minute, LiDAR technology requires the LiDAR scanner to be on the drone together with a quite powerful computer system and a lot of storage. Uh, it's possible you could have just the LiDAR scanner on the drone, be data streaming all of the information to the ground and have the computer and the storage on the ground, which would be saving the amount of weight on the drone. Uh, another option is wireless base stations, uh, like the one on the right, which you could take out in the, into the field. Uh, I think it might have a generator, it's also got solar charging. And there's also uh, talks about wireless charging of the drone. 
<coughs> one of these technologies is U beam where um, ultrasound transmits the electricity wirelessly to the drone, which is very cool. Um, hydrogen fuel cells are another example, as you can see down the bottom, which provide over four hours of flight time. Um, onboard computing, obviously the autopilot has a lot to do in just flying the drone and is limited in computational power. So as with the Phantom 4 I showed you earlier, the computer vision, you can have onboard computers that do extra stuff, such as again computer vision. Uh, both the unique Typhoon H and the DJI Phantom have uh, obstacle avoidance technology which would protect our cultural heritage while you're recording it. Um, SLAM is a, another well, kind of it's kind of a dream, but it, it will be amazing when they get it to work, which is simultaneous localization and mapping, where the drone can just fly around a structure, not crashing into anything, and it's going to be mapping it as it flies, and it will know its position on the map it's creating. So it will be able to return back to it at the beginning. This is being researched for search and rescue and disaster response. Um, another option is the pre-nav system over here, which I came across last week, which basically has a, a ground-based system that rec uh, records the structure from the ground, creates a 3D model of it, and then the drone navigates around this 3D model. I was talking to, there's a guy in geography who has a LiDAR drone, which is very cool, which uses RTK, and he was talking about doing a low-level LiDAR scan inside a building to determine the building structure, and then using that, again, as a 3D model to navigate around to do the high-level LiDAR scan of the building. Uh, swarm technology is another really cool technology where multiple drones are coordinating. Again, it's being developed for disaster response, uh, different drones can carry different recording packages and uh, a base station can uh, record where they've been and tell the drones where to go next and they can detect and avoid each other. Yes, last one. Yeah, our plans for the future is to continue future scanning the developments in autonomous vehicles and other useful technologies, determine their potential impact on culture heritage and archaeological recording and have a play with some of these technologies. Thank you.